Dennis, Margaret, hit your unmute button. There we go. I didn't have a question. I'm just logging on. Oh, okay. No, no worries. Okay. Sorry. Well, welcome. <laughs> Glad you're here. Okay. Thank you. Well, welcome to my home, everyone. <laughs> <laughs> there you go. Why don't we do this? It's seven o'clock. Um, what I'd like to do is get started so we can uh, allot enough time to Brian to do his presentation. But welcome everybody that's here. Um, I'm Paul Brenneman. I'm the emergency manager for Conwood Heights. Hopefully most of you recognize my face made for radio. Um, we will, uh, we're gonna talk a little bit about ShakeOut Fall 2.0, I think that's what we called it, right, Carlos? Right. We'll give you some updates on the uh, participation and the outcome of ShakeOut 2.0, and I'm going to turn it over to Carlos. But before I do that, I need to share my screen. Give me a second. <clears throat> Two more seconds, Carlos. We got it in just a second here. Right. Sorry for the delay. It's new to me, and I just need to make sure I get the right screen shared. All right, can people see my screen? Yep. Carlos, have you got it? Yep. All right, Carlos, it's all yours. Just tell me when you want me to change the, the screen. Okay, well, thanks, Paul. Um, this is the major drill that we uh, engage in every year uh, with the uh, radio club. And, uh, and so it's, uh, it's one we, uh, we practice for and get ready for uh, really throughout the year. And uh, it represents, uh, how we will respond in a major emergency, primarily in our, our case, in our location, we think that's most likely to be an earthquake. And so uh, what, we, what we do is, is uh, orient ourselves to be able to respond and provide information to Paul and his incident management team uh, that will help them most effectively manage the, uh, uh, the incident, uh, the emergency. Next uh, slide. Go ahead, Paul. Okay, so uh, these are the goals that we set for the communications group. This isn't. This doesn't represent all of the things that uh, uh, perhaps Paul. Uh, the broader things, I guess I should say, that Paul would uh, uh, have in mind, or that the the districts and precincts might have in mind. This is this is a a, a bit of a uh, stovepipe on what the uh, communications uh, organization. What we wanted to. Uh, accomplish as a communications organization. So uh, first we wanted to make sure all of the six major districts did participate from a comm standpoint, a communication standpoint, and we did that. Uh, it's also very important, uh, St. Thomas More has been added uh, uh, to the, uh, to the uh, list of major uh, participants in our organization. And, uh, and so we had uh, communications with the parish. Um, and of course, in the era of COVID, we had to do social distancing, wear face masks and, and be careful, which we did. Uh, the rec center, as everyone I think knows, will be a major shelter in the uh, case of emergency. And we had streaming video and we had audio coming from the, uh, from the rec center and that worked just fine. Uh, mostly we assume in a major, earth, a major earthquake scenario, that we don't have cell phones uh, or internet. And so our baseline communications assumes that they, those things are not available. But 
there might be some. And so uh, we do uh, practice using uh, cell phones and, and the ability to send uh, uh, images by cell phone. Uh, when we have to, to uh, take a picture and convert it to uh, data and send it by ham radio, it's a pretty cumbersome uh, process. And uh, as long as there's any cell phone available anywhere um, uh, from, from someone we're uh, communicating with, we'll want to use that rather than try to do the cumbersome way where all the cell, phone, cell phones are down. And we did, we did uh, validate that. We have an excellent drone operator and he provides uh, uh, near real-time video. Uh, he comes to the EOC, Paul gives him a mission. He goes out and flies that mission comes back and hands us an SD card and, uh, and I'll show you just a few of the still pictures that he, he did. That's a huge, huge part of, of uh, what we try to provide to the city. Uh, WinLink, uh, many of you will not be familiar with, that's a, uh, an email messaging system using radio. And this is a, a, a technology that we will use uh, in order to communicate with the county and uh, Brian, you may or may not know, I think the state is also um, uh, using WinLink. So we verified that the WinLink, uh, our WinLink system, hardware and software was working. So we accomplished all the goals that we had set uh, for the communications group. And I, I wanna thank uh, uh, those, all of those who participated. It was, a, it was a good exercise. Next one. Okay, I, I won't spend any time on this other than that you'll note that uh, the first couple of uh, milestones were early in the year when we thought, uh, before we knew that COVID was coming. And then we did, went to plan B or 2.0 or however we referred to it and uh, restructured our, our, uh, our uh, milestone. So we, we always do a, a pretty detailed uh, project plan so that, we're, so that we make sure that all of the things we want to accomplish get done. Next slide. So this is how um, this is how we were uh, how the uh, district communications played out. Uh, the Brighton district uh, had two precincts uh, active. That is, and when I say active, uh, by that I mean they provided uh, uh, block captain data to our uh, district communications operator in the Brighton district. And uh, two precincts were active out of the six. Uh, Brighton has been very, very active in the past, and I'm sure they will be again in the future, but uh, uh, this time uh, they had two precincts active. Butler, uh, as usual again, was uh, uh, hit, the, hit the ball out of the park and all of their districts, all of their precincts were, uh, were active. Uh, Butler West, uh, they did have four uh, precincts, actually five precincts, that participated, but they didn't. And now, by the way, this is uh, the data that I got from my communications people, but I believe that five of the precincts, at least at the precinct level, uh, provided some simulated data. Uh, and one of the precincts in Butler West provided actual block captain data out of the seven precincts that they have. Cottonwood Creek, um, uh, we provided some, uh, some file data so that we could validate the uh, district communications, but none of the precincts were active in Cottonwood Creek this time. Uh, Cottonwood Heights, uh, again, another uh, excellent performance, uh, five out of the seven. And Wasatch, uh, Wasatch has been a, a star performer in the past. They, they did have four out of the six this time, um, a little down from what they normally do. So uh, what we're saying is that uh, uh, active precincts in terms, uh, and by that we mean we received uh, data uh, representing the input from block captains that went up through the district communications, were sent to the EOC and were posted on the screen uh, that Paul could see the status of the city. So 17 out of uh, 37 precincts were active and, and our hope is that uh, uh, more will be able to do that when we do this again next year but the communication support was, was there for all six districts. Next uh, chart. Okay, I'm, I'm gonna go through just briefly what worked well. A little bit of this is technical to us and, and I, won't, uh, I won't spend much time on that. Um, the six districts uh, uh, are, uh, are well staffed and uh, we do need a couple of additional uh, backup communicators, but uh, the six districts are working well. The Rex Center, uh, mesh communications, the video and the audio 
uh, voice communications is working well. The EOC setup with all the equipment that the city has provided to us, the equipment, the way we set it up, uh, all of that is working well. We continue to tweak that a little bit, but we were able to get an EOC, I think an EOC in a box was the terminology Paul used uh, when we started out. We don't have a, a private room anywhere, uh, Brian, but we have uh, uh, cabinets of equipment. We have a trained crew who can set up on with tables and chairs and computers and radios in 20 to 30 minutes uh, of arrival. So we're very happy that uh, that, that is still working well and, and we tweak it. We updated all of the Win 10 uh, computers before the drill so we didn't have to have updates. The drone video is is go, is uh, excellent and uh, an important part of what we do. We got some new uh, members this year who are very enthusiastic, which we appreciate. Uh, what we call the initial voice operator team, it, when an emergency hits, uh, what we want all of our members, our, our communications members to do is get on a specified frequency that we call City One, a commercial, commercially licensed frequency. And the first operator that gets on will, uh, will uh, uh, become the net control operator. May ha hand that off, but, but at the beginning of, of an event, whether it's a drill or a real event, uh, we want somebody on the air taking check-ins and beginning to uh, create a network, a voice network uh, for the event. Uh, and, and so we're training people to do that. And we'll have some, some people whose job will be to be one of the part of that team. But uh, it, we're training all of our members to, uh, uh, to be able to respond quickly because the EOC won't be set up for that 20 to 30 minutes. And so in the interim, somebody is running the network. Uh, next slide. Okay, so those were the things we thought worked uh, really well. This is what we learned and, and want to improve on. Uh, overall precinct uh, participation, you could see from the prior chart that that really needs uh, to, uh, to improve if, if we're going to provide the benefit to the city. We, we need the precinct uh, precincts to be more active. To that end, Paul and I have talked about uh, precinct training on the CSV files. That's, that's one of the technical aspects. If you've got active block captains, we need to be able to get the data into these so-called CSV files so they can be sent by radio to the EOC. And we'll be doing that, uh, Paul, maybe December or maybe January. You know, we can talk about when that will, will come. Uh, the rec center we set up, uh, we have a, I have a kit at my house that we take over there and we set up the cameras and et cetera. We, we have now done um, uh, inspections of the uh, rec center. We're working with their management. We want to get permanent, a permanent camera, camera <laughs> installed uh, at the rec center. And we want to have a kit of equipment that will be stored at the rec center so an operator can go directly there and uh, get everything set up. And the next note says we need some operator notes. Some, one of our trained operators can go there, there. He'll have all the equipment he needs and he'll have the, uh, the notes to have help uh, he or she uh, set that up. And uh, one of the things that we needed to improve has already been improved, and that's Paul provided uh, for our large screen display, which we use for uh, displaying the uh, rec center video and the drone video. Uh, how are we doing on time, Paul? Am I? <clears throat> We're uh, just about to the end, Carlos. Okay, and I'm just about at the end also. So Paul gave us, uh, provided a display adapter, cables, and a, and a USB adapter. Next, and that's already taken care of. Next slide. Uh, Melissa, another important thing that came out of this, Melissa is going to create a new red status chart script, which will uh, allow the data that we're getting from our red status uh, situations to go directly into her software. To, to our GIS software. And that can be displayed for Paul immediately and uh, much better than the way, the sort of uh, low tech way we're doing it right now. Uh, we need to, and, and the rest of these things are technical things that uh, I need to do in chart. So uh, those are the things we want to improve. Uh, if you want to just flip through a couple of the slides, Paul, people can see there's the, the big screen TV and uh, you can see the uh, uh, the, we, the map of the city with the block captain uh, uh, resident status data displayed. You can see on the one screen the, uh, the video that came in. Here's one of the uh, district operator positions, uh, Bright, uh, Butler District. And finally, a couple of slides that show 
what we got from our drone, which is so, so uh, impressive. And that's it. Let me just touch off on a couple of things, Carlos. Remember that it's important during shakeout, the, the primary thing we're doing is exercising our communications ability between residents and the EOC. And I yeah. use that data and real time data is what we're striving for, but we use that data to prioritize responses of, of limited city resources. And the red data that Carlos referred to is in the emergency management world, that is an emergent situation where life is threatened. And that would be our utmost priority. Our first priority is the, the is uh, life. And so that red status helps me understand where that's occurring and dedicate resources to those red um, figures or those red, uh, that red data that's coming in. Um, the rest of the data is important, but the red data is critical at that point in time. So give me two seconds here. Let me switch to the results from ShakeOut. This is a map provided by our GIS specialist, Melissa Blue. Melissa does, give me just a second here. It's not what I wanted. So this is the data that was collected during ShakeOut. And each one of these white dots represents a residence within the city. And that's information that are residences that did not participate or we didn't receive information from. You'll see located throughout the city, we have green status, red status, black, and you should have some, the yellow status. So you can see our legend down here. It talks about the different status results and you've got the participation by percentage of districts um, here on the left. But as you can see, we've got some very large holes, which is kind of disappointing, but it's not to be unexpected. This was a non-traditional time. We usually do shake out in April of every year. We have the benefit of the state of Utah doing all of their mass um, advertising for shake out. Um, people expect it in April, and it was just kind of a strange time for us. But we do think it's important. Um, we do do a fall participant or a fall shakeout um, for the communications group every year. We just expanded it to include the collection of actual data. So you can see up here on the map, this map is available. We can distribute that. But uh, we did have some very active participation and not so active. So let me stop sharing my screen and. All right, I think I'm back. With that, are there any questions on ShakeOut before we get started and do what we all came here to see and that's Brian's presentation? If you do have a question, raise your hand and I'll let you, I'll activate your mic and you can speak, ask the question. All right, having seen there's no questions, Brian Stinson, Department of Emergency Management with the state of Utah. Brian was uh, kind enough to agree to do this presentation for us. Um, I will let him introduce his background, his specific uh, uh, position that he holds with Be Ready Utah, and maybe a little, uh, he can give us a little uh, advertisement for Be Ready Utah. I'm sure he will throughout his presentation, but um, Brian, I'll let you take it away, sir. All right. Well, um, thanks for having me here, Paul, and thanks everybody for being here. What we do with Be Ready Utah is we just try and help people to be more prepared for emergencies. It actually all started back at Hurricane Katrina, if you can remember that, back in 05, when then Lieutenant Governor Herbert saw that a lot of people there didn't have so much as a, as a bottle of water in preparedness. And there's so much that people could have done to take care of themselves, but they were waiting for the government, for the Red Cross, for the Boy Scouts to come and rescue them. And that's, we, we know that that is not the most effective way to do it. We're here in Utah, we're a self-reliant state. And so again, then Lieutenant Governor Herbert came back and they started the Be Ready Utah program, which is helping the citizens of the state to help themselves prepare as individuals, as families, and as communities. So that's, that's kind of the background of Be Ready Utah. 
my background, I um, originally I was in in the the film industry. I worked on some some movies there and worked there for a number of years. And then I got into my family's emergency preparedness business and I began teaching emergency preparedness to uh, all the uh, customers and other people that request us to come out teaching. And I loved it so much uh, that uh, when this position opened up a, a few years ago with Be Ready Utah, I applied for it. And now I get to teach people about emergency preparedness full time, and it's wonderful. I love to help people be more prepared and ask and, and answer some of those questions that they ask about just the, some of the little things that, well, well, how do I do this? Well, you just do that, and they get the glow in their eyes. I can do that, and that's what emergency preparedness is all about. We can do that. Every little thing we do can help us be more prepared. And the more prepared that we are individually, that means that we won't be a burden, burden on our community. And even more important than that, we can help our community members that maybe were impacted more than we were or that weren't as prepared as we were. So that being said, let me go ahead and get started with uh, the presentation here. I'm going to share my screen. Okay, so as advertised, we're going to be talking about hygiene and sanitation. And one of the things about hygiene and sanitation, most people have not thought about it at all for their emergency preparedness. All right, so hygiene and sanitation. You know, as a society, there's a lot of things that we have, a lot of conveniences, and we can dump it. We can push a button, we can pull a lever or bring it to the curb, and all of our sanitation worries are just taken care of. But what about when those conveniences are all gone? What do we do then? Unfortunately, many people often become lazy or apathetic with their sanitation and, and hygiene when all the comforts of home have been taken away. Have you ever been out hiking on trails and um, maybe you're out there and what happens when the garbage can gets full that's along the trail? Yeah, that's what happens. And that's just in normal times when, uh, when uh, th th things are normal and we just get lazy. Imagine a time of crisis when we're stressed, maybe we're scared we're trying to survive and all of those comforts of home have been taken away. What happens then? <clears throat> there was one time, another story. Uh, my brothers and I were out uh, camping and they brought some of their, their youngins along with them. And there was some improper hygiene things that were going on. I mean, you know, I'd always been taught, you know, you're out camping, you dig the little hole, you put everything in there that you, you don't want to see, and you cover up the hole. But some of the youngest ones had, had never been out camping, and uh, some unpleasantness ensued. You know, and it's, and it's one thing for this to happen out on a mountain with thousands of acres, and it's, you're, just, you're gone for just a few days. But what about if this happens in your neighborhood? And it's not just for a few days, it might be for a few weeks, or perhaps if it's bad enough for a few months. We can't let this happen. Both you and your family and your community are gonna suffer the consequences. Improper sanitation and hygiene that leads to disease, things like typhoid, dysentery, diarrhea, cholera, all of those things can be deadly. And in fact, um, in 2010, the, there was a, a really catastrophic earthquake in Haiti. Because of improper sanitation, more than a million people got sick with cholera. It's, it's very contagious. Thousands of people died, not even directly from the earthquake, but from the spreading of the disease. After that incident, a study showed that the outbreak, outbreak began in a professionally set up shelter that was just improperly disposing of their waste. It was exposed. It was getting into their drinking water, and that's how the disease started and spread. And again, these are bad enough in normal everyday life, but during a disaster when medical supplies and hospitals aren't going to be available, I mean, just, just imagine the last time you, 
<laughs> ate something bad or something and what did you do? You went to the doctor, you went to the drugstore. What happens if those are unavailable? So what's the number one rule of emergency hygiene and sanitation? Pretty simple. Keep yourself and your living environment clean. Now, what does that mean? Uh, it's, it's a little bit more difficult to do when we don't have that running water and we don't have functioning sewers and garbage removal, but it is still possible, but you've got to have a little bit of knowledge and you've got to put a little effort into it. One of the simplest things you can do to, proper, to, to practice proper hygiene is pre to prevent, <laughs> one of the simplest things you can do to prevent the spread of germs is, well, what do we talk about with uh, this COVID? Washing your hands, right? You gotta wash your hands. The CDC says that the average human touches their face about 25 times an hour. I mean, I was just watching myself in the little video here every once in a while, I scratch my face and scratch my nose. How often do we do that? And you think if you're not watch, if you don't have the means of washing your hands, how, what are you putting on your face? What are you putting in your eyes and around your ears and your nose and your mouth? During times of stress, your immune system, it's weakened and you become even more susceptible to, Ill, to illness. So you've got to keep your hands clean. Hand washing with soap and water is the, the easiest way to do it, but you may not always have access to soap and water. So that's where a good alcohol-based hand sanitizer, it's an effective alternative if you don't have the soap and water. But you got to make sure that uh, it's a uh, high enough alcohol content. Now, having supplies for a hand washing sanitation at your home, things you want to have, uh, bar liquid soap. Uh, you know, a lot of times we talk about you don't want to have act antibacterial soap, but in an emergency situation, it might be a good thing to have a supply of that. Paper towels and dispenser. Uh, you don't want to have a cloth towel for, for drying hands. You want to be able to, once you dry your hands, throw that paper towel away. Make sure you have a trash can there for the paper towels. Clean, clean water in that dispenser. Yeah, you want to have a spigot faucet, not just a push button. It's because you want that water to be able to run freely over your hands to get it all off. And then you want to have a catch basin, depending on where you're, you're doing it indoors to prevent a mess indoors and you want to have a catch basin to catch it so you're not creating a mud uh, slip hazard if you're outside. Now you also want to clean all the surfaces that are frequently touched like the spigot, like the soap dispenser, maybe the paper towel holder. And this is a cleaning solution that you can create just from, from bleach. This is uh, a tablespoon of bleach per gallon of water. That's a cleaning solution that's way too strong. That's not for drinking water. Okay, we also want to think about not just your hands, but your whole body. You may not be able to have the time or the resources to bathe every single day, but if, if you don't, you're going to start having some sores and ir irritation forming. And that's not very fun if you're already trying to, uh, to get things back together and you're already stressed. One thing you want to think about as you're doing this is you've got to conserve your water. You don't, I mean, you've got stored water for drinking. Uh, you've got to conserve it, but not at the expense of hygiene. So you can do things like camp showers. They're convenient. Uh, they can be heated. There's all sorts of different kinds of ones that are you know, propane or solar. Uh, those tend to use a lot of water, but that's an option. Another thing is knowing how to do a sponge bath. Uh, those, are, those use a lot less water. Hygiene wipes are a really good thing. These are what they use in hospitals for a lot of people that can't get out of beds. Uh, get, have a supply of these at home. It's an easy way to, to clean your body. Just start at your head and work down to your toes. Okay, how about your teeth? You know, it's... Uh, it's a good thing to brush your teeth anyway, not just for uh, socializing with people, but try imagine a toothache without the, the availability of a dentist. Maintain your daily oral hygiene. Your clean teeth, your fresh breath, even your combed hair, all that kind of stuff. Uh, it helps you 
feel human and it's it's good for your mental health as well as you, as your personal hygiene and physical health laundry learn how to do laundry make sure you have the supplies you need to do that your washing machine may not be available so you're going to have to learn how to clean things by hand same thing with dishes make sure you have the supplies for doing that okay now let's talk about keeping your living environment clean we talked about going along the trail and seeing the overflowing garbage cans. So what do you do with all the garbage and trash that's created? I mean, after, after a disaster, we're still gonna be uh, opening up our cans of spam and all of that. What do we do with all of that that's created? We live in a disposable society and as such, we create a lot of rubbish. In fact, in my house, I've gotta take the trash out at least once a day. So what happens when the garbage truck doesn't come anymore? What happens when, it, when that becomes this? That is not healthy. First of all, remember we've got to keep the roads clear. In a large scale emergency, rescue ve vehicles need to get around. They need to get to you, wherever the emergency may be. So make sure you're not blocking streets. Second, this is a huge attractant for animals, many of whom might be displaced pets, and they've never been on their own before. So they're gonna be all crazy, not knowing what's going on, and this is an attractant to them, and it could be dangerous. It also attracts flies, insects, mice, and rats, and that, that attracts things like snakes and other predators. So this is all just bad. This is, we've got to avoid this. So how do we prevent it? Well, what's the thing that we hear about recycling? What do they tell us about that? You gotta separate, reduce, reuse, and recycle. And this very much applies to just keeping our living environment clean after a disaster. So usually what I talk about is separating the, the trash or what I call the non-biological hazards from the garbage or the biological hazards. So now we've separated the trash from the garbage. Now let's talk about what to do. Uh, well, we'll talk about the garbage later. This time we're gonna talk about the trash. So what can we do? We make it smaller so it doesn't uh, take up as much room. How can we do that? Well, crush it, right? Smoosh it. You can also burn it. Burn it is a possibility. Now uh, you have to be very careful with that. It depends on the local laws and the restrictions. If you live in an apartment, you probably won't be able to do very much burning, especially not on windy days. If this is an option to you, uh, you know, have, find, have a safe place of burning some of that trash. Make sure that your, if you have paper and those kinds of things, that you have a screen to keep it from blowing away. One of the, we don't want to create a second disaster after the disaster by creating a, a fire within our neighborhoods. So if burning is an option for you, practice fire safety. Now, once that ash is cooled down, put it in a metal bucket. You're gonna to wanna to save it. We'll talk about what to do with that cool ash a little bit later, but that's another option. Okay, other things that you can do after you make it smaller, other things you might just need to organize it and temporarily store it somewhere until services resume. You might need to play the Tetris game to cram it into as uh, small, a pace as, small a space as possible. Now, because this is not um, an attractant, this, if you've done the separation between the garbage and the trash properly, you should be able to store this either indoors out or outdoors. It's not a biological hazard, uh, but you do want to make sure that you keep it dry. Another thing you do also with the, the, the reuse and recycle, think about what else can I use it for? Depending on the, uh, the severity and the duration of the incident, you might not be able to go to the convenience store or the hardware store for a while. So what, what are you gonna do? Use your ingenuity, your creativity, your imagination, figure out new ways of using those items. What's the old, the old adage, one man's trash is another man's treasure. Learn how to make usable tools and items from those scraps. And one thing you can do, you can go to the Be Ready Utah website. You can see that uh, 
that uh, link up at the top, bereadyutah.gov. And we have some ideas on there of some things that you can do, uh, making cooking utensils and other things from, from some of your items from around the home. Okay, now what about the garbage, the biologically hazardous stuff? Well, you have to separate the liquids from the solids. And what do I mean by that? You know, the, the, the yellow stuff from the brown stuff. Depending on the liquid, okay, well, this is other kinds of liquid. Things like dish, laundry, bath water, those can be spread over gravel, uh, just harmlessly evaporate. Other things like your food waste, those can be dried and disposed of with the, uh, the other biological waste. Now, what do we do with the other stuff? Yes, that stuff, the, the putrefied human waste. That is, the, in combination, the liquid and the solid human waste it's, is one of the most toxic substances on the earth, and it has to be separated. You've got to separate the liquids from the solids just like the other garbage. And uh, other, otherwise, it's like I said, it's, it's very toxic. So it has to be separated to reduce its tox toxicity. Well, okay, so you, you say, I have a plan though. I don't need to worry about separation. I, all I am going to do is I'm going to dump a gallon or two of water down the toilet, get it to flush. If I don't have incoming water, uh, it's okay because it, it doesn't take power to flush the toilet. I just need some water. So it's gravity. It works by gravity. That's my plan. That's not a very good plan. Think about it. If the water's not working, a gallon or two, that's a huge waste of more than a day's worth of drinkable water. Also, depending on the emergency, if it was an earthquake or other incidents, the sewer system is probably broken or it's otherwise not working and that flushed waste is coming out wherever the break in the line is, it's possibly right under your house. So you're creating a toxic sewer right underneath your home uh, that is very dangerous. Plus think about it, if the, if the power's out, and the sewer pumps that push, push the waste to the treatment plants aren't working, uh, that sewage is going to be piling up in the pipes. Because uh, talking about, we talked about infrastructure a little earlier, it takes power to push that to the treatment plants. And if the power's out, it's not being pushed. So it's just backing up in the pipes. And uh, well, what's, what's the, old, the old saying about you know, stuff? flows downhill, those that are downhill are going to start seeing sewage coming up from their toilets and their drains. So you don't want to just put that stuff down the, down the toilet after uh, an earthquake or other large-scale emergency. Okay, well, I've got another plan then. Um, just so you know, I, I used to work in emergency preparedness, and a lot of times when um, uh, people would come in, uh, in, a, in a retail store, people would come into the store looking at adding to their preparedness supplies. Often times um, one person would turn to the other and point to the sanitation, sanitation kit and say, I want to get one of those. And usually it would be like the husband and he'd say, nah, we don't need one of those. When I'm out hunting, I just go behind a tree and that's good enough. That is not good enough. Think about it. Waste on the surface of the ground is a big attractant of all the vermin that we talked about before. Plus, the next rainstorm, it's going to spread it around. So, <clears throat> excuse me, that's not an option. Plus, how unsightly is it to see excrement? Yeah, you know, that's not something you, you want to see, let alone have to uh, be concerned about it getting into your living environment. So, like I said before, it's one thing if you're out in the wilderness, it's another when you're in a densely populated community and it's been weeks without plumbing and the sewer system working. This is how deadly disease spread. Going behind the tree is not an option. Okay, well, I'll, then I'll just uh, dig a hole and I'll bury it in the backyard. And maybe I'll even kick some dirt over the top of it. Nope, that doesn't work either. That putrefied waste, it's still gonna go into your soil and make your soil toxic. 
It'll seep into the ground waters. The animals will just dig it up and spread it around. So you can't even just dig a little hole in your backyard and bury it. Okay, well then if I can't do that, what if I build an outhouse over the hole like the pioneers did? That'll protect it from the animals, right? Nope, that doesn't work either, sorry. That putrefied waste is still gonna seep into the groundwater and we are still just too densely populated to safely bury untreated human waste. Okay, well, I have an RV. I can just use the toilet in there until normal services return. Nope, that doesn't work either. How long can your RV go before it needs to be emptied? I know that my family, I have a family of four, we can go maybe five or six days before emptying the holding tank. That's all great and fine. What if the emergency is longer than five or six days? Okay, so I just empty it when it gets full, right? Just like I do when I go camping. <clears throat> I know of a few different dumping stations near me. No worries, right? Nope, sorry, that doesn't work either. All the roads are, think about it, after an earthquake, are the roads clear? Can you get to the dumping station? Do you have the fuel to make multiple trips there? Also, probably everybody else that has an RV is thinking the same thing. You ever gone to a dump station after a summer holiday weekend? I know that uh, last time I tried that, it was a few hours before I was get out got, before I got out of there because the lines were so long. So that doesn't work either. Plus those dumping stations, they fill up, they need to be emptied as well. And during an emergency situation, they're not gonna be a high priority to be emptied. And if they're full or not functioning, they're just gonna be locked down. So that's not going to be an option. So what usually happens, people have their RVs full and they don't have any place to dump it. So what they do, uh, studies have shown after emergencies, people go to other neighborhoods, other communities, and they just dump it in the gutters and along the roadways, causing a toxic mess for others, literally bringing their crap to other people. So RV is not a good option either. So I've told you all the problems with all the plans that a lot of people have already had. So what do you do when you got to go? Expelling our bodies of waste, it's an important part of everyday health. And we need to provide a safe, private, and sanitary means for ourselves and our family to do their business in a relatively comfortable way. Many people tend to hold it if they're not comfortable using what exists, waiting for something else. If there's nothing else, they can get stopped up, causing major digestive problems. I remember when I was a scout, there was a young scout that went on a, we were on a, a week long camp out, one of the youngest scouts in our troop. He didn't want to use the facilities that were provided because they were kind of icky and not as clean as uh, how his mommy kept it for him. So he held, held it. He held it for a number of days. He didn't make it to the end of the week because he had to go to the emergency room because he was stopped up and he had uh, he had some major digestive problems. So that's not holding it's not an option. So when it comes to using the potty in private or the potty in public, most people suffer from stage fright. So if available, you can use your existing restroom. It's clean, it's protected from outside vermin, it's manageable. If that's not available, you can use another room in your home indoors exclusively as an alternate restroom area. If you have to use outdoors, block off a corner of a room or, or uh, in the yard with tarps or blankets to create a privacy shelter, but privacy is important. <clears throat> another reason to use the existing restroom is the proximity. It's close enough to the living environment that family and members won't unnecessarily hold it. But if you have to create one outside, make sure it's close enough so family members can easily find their way there and back again safely. Think about ease of use for your sanitation. Keep it simple for everyone. Adapt for the abilities of young children, young, young children, elderly, or those with access and functional needs. 
teach everyone how to properly use the emergency facilities. It's got to stay clean. Have your hand washing and hand, hand washing station or hand sanitizer nearby. Clean the area frequently with disinfectant. I talked about how to make disinfectant earlier. Wear PPE. We all, we all know what PPE is now that uh, with this coronavirus, your personal protective equipment when disposing of the waste. Make sure that you protect yourself from that. Dispose of or sanitize any article of clothing or object that comes in contact with that waste. So, how do we dispose of it? Well, uh, like I talked about before, your liquids and your solids, you've got to separate. Urine and fecal matter must be separated since they are disposed of in different ways. A two bucket system separating liquid and solid waste is an effective and sanitary means of taking care of human waste in an emergency. The Be Ready Utah brochure, um, I'll show you this after, at the end of the presentation. Uh, we have a list of suggested items to put in your two bucket porta potty kit, and it can be found at bereadyutah.gov. So we'll, I'll show you that brochure uh, again at the end. So bucket number one, you don't need to have a bag in it and it's used exclusively for liquid urine. Have that separate bucket. So you're saying, Brian, that we've got to have two different things. So while I'm going, I need to hold it and switch while I'm, yeah, that's, that's the way to do it safely. All right, so. Uh, empty after each use into the bushes or over gravel where it's going to harmlessly evaporate. You don't want to dump it on pavement or asphalt where it might pool. You probably don't want to throw it on your lawn or the garden. That concentration of urine is way too toxic for growing things. And then uh, rinse the bucket and you, it's ready to be used again. Give me just a second here. Uh, needed a needed a quick drink. Okay, bucket number two. That's for the solid fecal waste only. Uh, to make the solid waste inert, it has to be completely dry. That's why we separate for separate it from the liquid waste. How do we make it dry? Well, first you, you got to line the bucket with two heavy plastic bags, and you put a layer of kitty litter in the bottom. So how many of us that don't have cats have a supply of kitty litter? Uh, I, don't, I don't have a cat. I don't like cats, but that's just me. But uh, we need to have a supply of kitty litter in our uh, emergency sanitation supplies. As you're depositing waste in there, you, can, you cover it with more kitty litter to absorb the moisture and to reduce the odor, odors, just like the cats do. Once it's full, you put on your PPE, secure, securely tie off the bags with twist ties and carry them outside still in the bucket to prevent the spills. Don't carry it out in the bag. That is a potential for breaking open and you, you don't want to break that open and have it spill out in your home or someplace else before you're ready to dispose of it. So yeah, carry it out in the bucket. For convenience, you can use your, the, your bathroom toilet for solid waste. You might not have a lot of room for two buckets and the toilet in there. So if you wanna create what's called a dry toilet, uh, you'd wanna use the, the toilet for the, the, the number two, your number two bucket. Turn off the incoming water, scoop out the remaining water in the tank and the bowl. Remember, you don't flush, don't put any liquids down your, your system. Make sure your, your toilet's clean, scrub it clean. Line it with a large garbage bag, just like in the bucket. Make sure you have the right size, probably for, well, this, that's an elongated industrial toilet. You'd probably need to have the larger black uh, garbage bags, but if you have a regular regular size toilet, maybe the, the white kitchen sized garbage bags would be able to fit it. Make sure you have a really good supply of these. You don't want to run out of these, these bags and have them in your storage. So just like the bucket, put some kitty litter in the bottom of the bag in the bowl. Now, temporary storage. This is for if maybe you live, you have a very small yard or maybe no yard, you, maybe you live in an apartment, a townhome, 
someplace where you, you can't bury the waste. Um, this is a temporary storage option. You can store it outside, put it in a concealed area. You don't want uh, other people or uh, anybody to, to see where you're, you're storing that. Use a large garbage can with a tight lid. Probably don't want to go any more than like 30 gallons. Secure it to a strong post or to a tree so it doesn't fall over. Strap down the lid with a rope or with bungee cords. Double bag the can just uh, as a safety preventative measure. Uh, open the bag of waste and then empty the kitty litter and the waste into the can. Then put the empty bag in the can as well. After dumping in the waste, throw in your disposable gloves as part of your PPE uh, that, that you wore to carry it outside. Hey, Brian. Yes, sir. We have one question uh, from Wendy Wixom. She's asking, how do you calculate how much kitty litter to have on hand? Well, that's one of those things like how much water should you have stored for an emergency? Uh, you would kind of want to think about, um, well, I know you can go to IFA. I think IFA has really big bags of it. If you want to do something like that, you can, I think that's a good price. But in terms of how much, I mean, as, as much as maybe you have uh, room and budget for, uh, how, how many people are in your family? How often do you think you're going to be using it? Some of these things might be good for the next time you go camping. Try out this method of sanitation instead of using your RV or the provided, depending on where you're going. Try and, and use this and see how long you can go or, or how, how much it takes to before you fill a bucket. You only need enough kitty litter in the bottom of the bucket to, to create a layer. And then once, once it's been used, you only need to put enough on it to cover a, a light covering over the, the waste. So that's, that's a good question of, of how much, but it depends on how many people are in your home and how long the emergency is. So I don't have a definitive answer, but I would say have, have many bags of it. Brian, I have one more live question. Can I, it's from Lynn Mars. Go ahead, Lynn. Lynn, go ahead and uh, unmute your phone or unmute your uh, computer. Lynn, can you hear us? Yeah, can you hear me? There, there we, we go. go. Yep. Okay. Uh, it's been a while, but the last time I checked, neither the state the county or the city has any provisions for collecting this uh, this human waste. Does that change? Right. That's uh, this. It wouldn't be a state thing. It would be local, and that's something <clears throat> that we talk about a little later in the presentation. You need to talk to your emergency manager if uh, anybody knows who that might be of uh, of Cottonwood Heights, Paul. <laughs> and, and and well, these are things that need to be. Uh, talked about at a city level and with the health department. Uh, and those are one of the truth, things that we'll look into. Sure. Okay. And, and to tell the truth, most, most jurisdictions don't have a plan for this. Now, yeah. this being said, um, once that waste is completely dried out, I mean, what do you do? Anybody have a cat? What do you do with your cat's waste? You put it in the garbage, right? And, and it goes to the, 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 the landfill. Cities need to have a plan of what they're going to do with this waste that's going to be generated. Um, that's, that's something that as a, as a state, we can't answer that because that has to be uh, taken care of at a local level. So I, I, I'd like to have a, a better answer for you with that, Lynn. And I, I don't, I, I'm not just passing the buck. It's just this, 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 that's not something that the state handles. Okay, well, I'm off here now. Okay, and, and we need to, as, as individuals, we need to take that upon ourselves to, to talk to our cities uh, and, and make plans. I mean, not going in there, what plans do you guys have, but talk to them about the, the different things that we can do. Talk to the, the sanitation experts within your jurisdiction and see, see what the plans are. If things are separated and they, be, and they become inert, the solid waste is dry, Liquid, again, we don't need to worry about that as, as long as it dries out. Uh, that solid waste should be inert and be able to be buried. 
but again, that's up to your health department and your, your jurisdiction. Brian, we have one more question. Yes, Angie, please go ahead. Angie, go ahead. So the question I have is, why don't you just put the bag into the garbage can? Why do you have to dump it out into the garbage can? Well, that's, that actually is a, because the, the waste itself, it needs to be able to start to break down. It's not going to be breaking down in the garbage can, but once it gets to where it's supposed to be going, I mean, it's going to be in the bag of bags. I mean, the, the garbage can, the large garbage can is lined with garbage bags as well. And when it gets to where it's going, it needs to be able to be breaking down as fast as possible. And it can't break down as it needs to, if it's still inside of that other, the smaller garbage bag. Does that make sense? Yep. It, it makes, it's, it's more important in the next one when we talk about burying it. So it, it doesn't matter as much. Oh, just for simplification, we just try and say, uh, when you bury it, you do the same thing that you do in the, in the, the garbage can. But yeah, thank you. Prob okay, we're good with that then. Okay, so as you're dumping the 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 ash and the the garbage bag, I'm sorry, the waste, the kitty litter, and the garbage bag into the garbage can, you that uh, that bucket's full of cold ash that we were talking about before. You want to put a little bit of a layer of that on top of the waste as well. Now, what is, what's the purpose of that? Well, it creates a barrier that pests, that they don't like to dig into. Now, if you don't have ash, if you are not able to burn, something you can do is you can have something else like lime. Uh, lime is very toxic and you have to be careful with that. Uh, it's a uh, hydrated lime, but that's something that you can have stored as well. You can get that at IFA and garden centers but it just creates something that keeps the vermin out of it. And uh, so they don't want to go digging through it. Okay, after you close the lid, spray the outer surface of the can with disinfectant and repeat that process each and every single time that you empty your bucket into the garbage can. Again, you need to contact your local health department for instructions on further disposal after that. You know, these are things you want to bring up before the emergency and in, in community forums like this of what are we going to do about it? Let's make some plans. Okay, burying the waste rather than putting it in a garbage can is, is the best option, but uh, you have to have a safe location, a minimum of 200 feet away from any water supply or a living area. When you do that, you need to dig a hole about two and a half to three feet deep and about two and a half feet in diameter. You, if you're doing that in your backyard, know where the buried pipes and other utilities are in your yard beforehand. And depending on the time of the year and your soil, you may need more than just a shovel to dig. So part of your emergency preparedness supplies could be things like post hole diggers or picks or other things to break up really solid ground. Um, one other thing to think about um, in this option, talking as a community, is, is there places within your community that people can bring their, ba their waste to safely be buried? If they're do again, if they're doing this safely, separating it and all that's coming is dry solid waste, is there some place in your community that uh, a few places that you can, can bring that if people don't have large enough yards? Okay, again, just like with the, with the can, when you, you're <clears throat> ready to empty into your hole, open the bag, empty the kitty litter and the waste into the hole, then put the empty bag in the hole as well. And this is what I was talking to uh, the, the person that asked the question before. The waste must be out of the bag for proper decomposition. Now, some people say, well, what about the bag? Uh, do we have to go back and dig up the bag later? Plastic garbage bags nowadays are made out of cornstarch. So they actually break down quite a bit faster than you, than you would think. It's, it's not like the, the thousand years or something. It's with, within a few years, the, that bag is pretty much dissolved. 
So cover it with ash and dirt after each dump uh, or just, just dirt, sawdust, or another absorbent material. Uh, that ash, again, it can come from the garbage you burned or you, you can use, again, like, like, like I talked about, hydrated lime to act as an irritating deterrent to animals and vermin to digging up your hole. Re remember, hydrated lime is very toxic and you have to use, use gloves and a mask to protect you from the dust. And again, you can get it at IFA or another agricultural store. Cover the hole with weighted boards or another barrier between dumps to, so people don't fall in, so animals and other things don't crawl into your hole. You wanna stop adding waste to the hole when the waste is about a foot to six inches from the surface. Then to finish burying the waste, continue filling the hole with dirt almost to the top, packing it down. And cover the dirt with more ash or hydrated lime, again, a deterrent to, to vermin, and top it with dirt and pack it down once again. You're probably gonna have a, you, you, when, when you're done, you should have a mound of dirt because over time that will sink down. Now, you also want to leave your germs and the, your PPE outside. Don't be tracking your, your muddy boots that maybe have some waste on them into the house. Leave all that stuff outside. Now, what about diapers and feminine hygiene? Well, one thing you want to think about as soon as you know that regular garbage pickup is suspended, or that uh, the sewer systems are not working, switch to reusable cloth options. Uh, for, for diapers, scrape the solid waste into the number two bucket with the kitty litter and store, store soiled diapers in a diaper pail with a lid and then launder them separately from everything else. <clears throat> Excuse me, so you don't wanna use the, uh, the disposable things that just, creates uh, a toxic mess. Okay, um, you know, and for feminine hygiene, that's, you know, I don't have a lot of experience with that, but I know that there are um, reusable options there. And that's kind of a personal option, but you can do research online and find out what options there are for, for feminine hygiene that's reusable as well. And in the same way, you launder it separately from everything else. So here's your to-do list. You want to gather your supplies, your disaster supply kit. Uh, you need to have sanitation and hygiene supplies in your disaster supply kit on the Be Ready Utah brochure that I was talking about that I'll, again, I'll show you at the end of the, the presentation. Uh, has a list of things to put in your disaster supply kit has a list of things to build your hand washing station, has a list of uh, things to build your two bucket kit. Think about your laundry and dishes. Do you have supplies to do laundry and dishes by hand? You don't wanna do your laundry or the dishes in the sink because that water might go down the drain. Have a, a, a tub, have a dishwashing tub and clothes washing tubs for doing that. Uh, there's all sorts of you know washboards, there's all sorts of different uh, ways of, of washing laundry that are, I think, a lot easier than, than uh, washboards, but uh, that's, that's, that's another question. Uh, make sure you have digging tools. Have a good supply of cleansers and disinfectants. One thing you wanna think about with your standard bleach, sodium hypochlorite bleach, it only has about a one year shelf life. So don't get a five year supply but uh, you wanna have a one year supply and be rotating it. And if you need cloth diapers or feminine supplies, make sure you have those as well. Other things to do, gather your, in gathering supplies, get your personal protective equipment. Um, you know, it's good having those uh, nitrile gloves that they use in hospitals, but for your sanitation, you might wanna have those heftier dishwashing gloves like uh, in the picture here. You wanna have some eye protection, you wanna have some uh, breathing protection, especially if you're going to be using hydrated lime. You need to protect yourself from that. Get yourself some good trench boots uh, for when you're burying that waste outside. 
other supplies? What, what do you, anybody have any ideas of some other supplies we might need for sanitation? Something that maybe this pandemic taught us that we need to have a good supply of? Any ideas? Yep, that's right, toilet paper. There really isn't a good uh, substitute for that. I mean, I know the pioneers used to use the, the old JC Penny catalog or the, use things like leaves or corn cobs, but that's just not pleasant. So have a good supply of that. Uh, how do you know how much you need of that? Well, maybe open up a package that uh, wherever you get it and write down the date of when you opened up that package and then write down the date of when you used up the last square out of that package. How long did that take? How long does your family go through that? And then maybe calculate, uh, have a few months supply of that. Find places around where you can bury the waste. If you use your yard, make sure you know where the buried utilities are. If you don't have safe room in your yard or you don't have a yard, plan on storage in the lidded gar garbage can or make arrangements with your community for a shared space. Again, that needs to be coordinated with your community, with, with Paul, with the health department. Um, many of these plans, you need, do need to ask your local health department and emergency management what uh, plans and recommendations that your community has. Maybe there's some things that are already in, uh, some plans are already in effect. Um, some may not have considered it. Volunteer to help develop, develop those plans. Adapt your emergency plans to fit with their guidelines. And then practice. Don't use the plumbing for a weekend. Has anybody ever tried to do something like that? I mean, you don't necessarily have to shut it all off, but try not using it. What worked? What didn't? What did you learn? One thing I learned when I tried that, I learned that living on one gallon of water a day is a very difficult thing to do. So I've planned a lot more stored clean drinking water than I had previous to me doing this. But it's a really fun, non-life-threatening way of finding what works and finding what doesn't. Another thing you can do is go camping. Many basic preparedness Skills are learned when you're out roughing it. I mean, uh, my, uh, the story I shared in the, in the very beginning of those youngsters that didn't practice safe sanitation, they learned some skills that on that camp out. And remember, in a disaster, you don't rise to the occasion. We all like to think, oh yeah, you know, if something happens, I'll rise to the occasion. I, I will meet the challenge. But really what happens? you sink to your level of preparedness. Are you ready? Well, that concludes the presentation. Uh, give me just a second here. So do we have any other questions about uh, emergency sanitation or hygiene? I can also share uh, that brochure with you. Let me do that real quick. Brian, I have a question from Craig. Go ahead, Craig. Go, Craig. Craig, you have to unmute your phone or your uh, computer. There you go. Yep. Okay. Um, can you put your last slide on that has your contact information so we have a little more time to copy it? Down? Yep, 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 yep. Oh, of course, I closed it all out. Let me open that back up again. All right. There you go. Are you seeing that? Yes, that's good. Leave it there for a few seconds. Yep, no worries. So, yeah, that's that's our office phone number, 801-538-3400. That's my email. And then you can go to bereadyutah.gov for a lot of information. We don't have on here uh, our Facebook and our Twitter 
But if you're if you're on Facebook or Twitter, just look up at Be Ready Utah. And uh, like I said before, we have all sorts of information. We put out at least four points of information every single day. Uh, that's uh, this month we're talking about uh, personal um, what is it personal items and tools that you might might want to have in your emergency supplies. And we're also talking about uh, Critical Infrastructure Awareness Month. Or, uh, Brian, I have another question from Angie. It says, can you yeah. mention again where it is okay to dump wastewater from cleaning and liquid waste? Sure. Yeah, uh, so, so liquid waste and cleaning, uh, you probably just want to put it over gravel you want to just put it maybe in the bushes. Now, depending on what the cleaning is, you know, if you have a, like a bleach solution, something, you don't want to put that in the bushes. Uh, you don't want to kill your bushes, but just over gravel, someplace where it can harmlessly evaporate. Don't put it over asphalt or, or on the concrete. It might pool up, but you want to put it someplace where it's easily going to evaporate. Now, things like urine, you might be able to put it on your grass. Don't put it all in the same area on your grass. You want to spread it out or else you're going to kill your grass. And don't put, um, don't put urine on your garden. Now, some people, they use, they, use, uh, they say, well, there's, I know some gardeners that, that use uh, composted human waste. They're, they're expert gardeners and that's just not a good idea. So over gravel is probably the best place to put that. Brian, I have another question from Joe Meyer. It says, how are yes. you treating your stored water? Well, that's a great question and I'll, t I'll answer it for you really quickly, but that's like an, another full hour presentation on, on treating your stored water. There's a lot of different ways that you can do that. One thing if you're using municipal water, an awesome thing with that, you don't have to treat it at all. Municipal water is regulated by the Environmental Protection Agency and is actually held to a higher standard than the bottled water that you buy from the store that's regulated by the FDA, the Food and Drug Administration. So if you're, sta if you're storing uh, municipal water in a clean container, you don't need to add anything to it. Did that answer your question, Joseph? Uh, I assume it did. Hang on for a second. I've got one more for you, Brian. Yep. It says, can you burn solid waste once dry? Uh, that's not recommended because that's, that's, you know, I, I don't have a solid answer on that. No pun intended. Uh, I wouldn't recommend it. It's best to <clears throat> let it dry out and, and bury it. All right, I've got a question from Craig. Go ahead, Craig. How long will that treated water, municipal water, last? Do I need to change it every month, every six months, every five years? Never. Another great question. And, uh, and I'll, I'll answer that in, in a really quick nutsh nutshell. But Paul, I think it sounds like we need to do the water presentation. I think you're right. <laughs> uh, that, it, it all depends on how it's stored. If you're storing it in ideal conditions, cool, dark, and dry in a clean container, a solid container, a uh, high density polyethylene container. Uh, the USU extension has done a study that shows it's the, it's almost indefinite for how long that will store. Now, if you're someplace that's not ideal conditions, like maybe in your garage, I know I store water in my garage because that's where I have room. I would probably recommend uh, checking it at least once a year. Uh, and what I do to check it is I open it up I do a little smell test. I do a little look. Does it look like there's some filmy something going on in the water? I actually dispense uh, in, in a, uh, a clear glass cup, take a look at it, make sure I don't have any floaties or anything going in it. And if it all looks clean, smells clean, I actually take a drink of it. And I, I've never had any problem with, with any of those. Um, 
if, if you start to have an issue with it, you want to empty it out and, and replace it with fresh. Now, that being said, I probably wouldn't want to go any more than four or five years if I'm storing it in the garage. Uh, another option you can, if you have no place else, you can store it in your backyard. Uh, let me, let me, I can talk a little easier when I make this. You can store it in your backyard uh, outdoors. You don't want to store it on the concrete. You want to cover it if you store it outdoors and you probably want to replace it every six months, probably spring and fall when it's uh, not frozen or not boiling hot. Uh, store it on the north side of your home. There is uh, another brochure on our website and I'll point that one out to you as well when we go to the hygiene one. Uh, that's all about water storage and treatment, but those are great questions. Any other questions before we go to the website real quick? Craig, um, one more, more question. Brian. Yeah, go ahead. Um, I'm assuming that all of your presentations are available at getready.gov or whatever that is. Be ready, Utah.gov. Be ready, by, by Utah .gov. The the presentations are not, but the information's there. So the powerpoints are there. Uh, no, they're they're not. We're we're working on that. Uh, some of these are still works in progress, but we're working on getting them there. Now this this presentation, um, because this is the first time I've 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 recorded this presentation, it will be posted on the uh, on our YouTube website. Craig, we'll Some also our, put it up on the city website as well. Okay, awesome. Wonderful. Okay, appreciate that. Okay, let us let me share real quick. This one. All right, so here's the Be Ready Utah website. Oh, just a second. Be Ready Utah website. Uh, yeah, just so bereadyutah.gov. If you scroll down, on the right hand side where it says popular downloads, this is a whole list of a bunch of brochures that you can, you can download them, you can send them out to friends and family, all sorts of ones. Uh, let's see, so hygiene and sanitation, that one right there. This is the one that we've been talking about. Here's how to make your hand washing station. Here is what to put in a hygiene kit that you can include in your disaster supply kit. Down here, we talk about sanitation in the, the temporary storage in the garbage can and also the burying waste and things to put in your porta potty kit. So that's the hygiene and sanitation brochure. Again, that's just on the right hand side of the Be Ready Utah website under popular downloads. Now we were talking about the water storage. Water storage is the one down at the very bottom but it talks about things to do to how much water you need to store, how you want to store that. And then the, the second page is how to treat the water once you've used up all of your safe, clean uh, water. So in case you've got to go out and get other. All right. Anybody else that, have any additional questions with, for Brian? All right, I don't see any more hands up. Hang on, wait, I got one coming in. Said, yeah. should PP be put in the bags with the solid waste? Should what? Toilet, toilet paper, paper? Put in the bags with solid waste. Yeah, throw, throw the toilet paper right in there. I mean, toilet paper breaks down, it's easy. One thing you don't wanna do is um, like the, the, the baby wipes and those kinds of things, they don't break down as well, but you'd probably need to throw those in as well. So yes, toilet paper goes right in the bag. Good question. Right, any more questions for Brian? Keep them coming. Looks like you answered them all, Brian. Well, great. So we much appreciate you taking time out of your night to be with us tonight. It was an important topic. There's no doubt about that. I learned a lot and I'm sure the uh, attendees did. So I just wanted to say thank you. Thank you much. And uh, I think we will bring you back for the water presentation. It sounds like that's one that's probably next on the list, maybe in February. Okay. All right. Yeah. Love to. Th thanks for, for inviting me. Great. Uh, it's, it's been great. And I, you guys all had great, insightful questions.
it's 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 good to get questions because it makes it ma lets me know that you're you're listening intently and you're learning. So Much thanks for having me. Well, having said that, I'm going to go ahead and uh, call the meeting to an end unless somebody else has questions that we can answer and and uh, we can go from there. All right. Having seen none. Thank you again for your attendance. We'll do this again the second Thursday in February. Put it on your calendars. We'll send out information on the topic. I think it's going to be the water topic, but uh, second Thursday, February 7 p.m. Hopefully we can do it in person, but if not, we'll do it on the Zoom platform again. Thank you, folks. You guys have a great night. Brian, thank you, sir. Thanks for having me. Looking forward to February. There you go. All right. Have a good night, sir. We'll see you.